So hi everybody, welcome ladies and gentlemen to the Commonwealth Chambers webinar on food security in Fiji, specifically focusing on the nation's inspirational youth that are driving technological innovation to tackle the challenges um, which Fiji has amongst many others. Today's webinar is an important opportunity to discuss the critical issue of food security in Fiji and to explore the steps that can be taken to ensure that all Fijians have access to nutritious and sustainable food. As many of you know, food security is a complex and multifaceted challenge that affects communities and individuals in different ways. It involves not only access to sufficient and nutritious food, but also the stability of food systems, the resilience of communities, and the sustainability of food production. Over the next hour or so, we'll sit in conversation with our distinguished speaker to explore the key drivers of food insecurity in Fiji, and discuss the innovative solutions that are being developed to build resilience in communities across the country. Our speaker for today is Rinesh Shamar. Rinesh is the founder of Smart Farms Fiji and is also a member of the Parliament of Fiji. In fact, he's the youngest member. He graduated from the Jawala Nehru Technological University with a Bachelor's in Computer Science and Engineering in 2018. In the same year, he began developing Smart Farms Fiji, an initiative to build hydroponic farming kits to be used by the local population as a cheap and sustainable way to grow fresh and nutritious vegetables, fruits and spices. Having experienced the lack of access to nutritious produce during childhood and subsequently the devastating effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on prices and availability of food, Rinesh conceptualized a large-scale system of hydroponic farming as a means to grow reliable and quick harvests of quality produce for localized access. More recently, he and his team have curated an at-home hydroponic kit containing tools to set up the farm and 15 seedlings of vegetables and fruits, along with a step-by-step -step guide that will allow anyone to successfully manage the home farm. Smart Farms Fiji has won numerous awards and secured substantial funding since inception. Since 2018, a 15,000 US dollar grant from the local Fiji government was granted to the entrepreneur to invest and incorporate hydroponic systems into large commercial farms across Fiji. The project also won the Youth Collab Challenge, organized by UNDP Asia in 2018, and received funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and One Young World in 2020, largely for the project's significance in alleviating the impact of COVID-19 on Fiji. Rinesh has also won the Prime Minister's International Business Award for Young Entrepreneur 2018 and the Commonwealth Youth Award for Excellence in Development in 2020. Not only was he recognized under the Fiji's 20 Under 20 Changemakers Initiative in 2020, he was also the nation's official representative during the Youth Pacific Summit 2020. In 2021, he was nominated for the Forbes 30 Under 30 Asia list. I'm sure Rinesh will tell us more about himself and smart farms, and we're, we are more than delighted to hear all about this. So Rinesh, over to you. Thank you, Julia, for the uh, lovely introduction. Um, took me back to the years of uh, the struggle and then the days, you know, as you were highlighting those achievements, because, um, you know, till, till this date, or oh, any su successful person can say that their success um, is always outnumbered by their failures because, you know, it's, it's the failures and challenges that shape your success. Um, yes, my name is Rinesh Sharma. I am 29 years of age from... Fiji, a beautiful nation in the Pacific region. Um, yes, here we um, have, we really face the brunt of climate change, and you know it has already, you know, for for the previous decade, you know, has been affecting our lives. And uh, as as a as a as a youth of the country, I feel like it's my responsibility to implement the change that the world talks about. But you know, easier said than being done. So Smart Farms Fiji basically was was uh, was born at the Youth Collab Summit in 2018 at the UNDP, where this initiative was awarded you know one of the top innovations for um, their summit, and the whole idea behind this was that we grow crops uh, in a healthy and sustainable way using local-based resources. Now 
the whole idea was to cultivate crops because we were a heavy dependent, uh, a country that's heavily dependent on um, importations of crops, and about a 200 million annually, or, you know, off the record. So the whole, the, I knew the problems that exist in agriculture. And while finishing software engineering in India, I told myself, let's embed technology into agriculture and fisheries and let's take the technology back home and try to make a difference. So that was how Smart Farms Fiji took off. Um, and this was in 2018. Great. Well, that's a great introduction, Rinesh. But I think before we go into that a lot, let's hear a bit more about you. So tell me about your story and how you got to where you are now, because I mean, I think that's as interesting as anything else. And it's certainly the backdrop to how you've got this exciting agricultural project in Fiji. Well, I think, um, uh, okay, if, if I go way back, I think uh, leaders are not born. I think they are cultivated and... Um, By hydroponic farming, right? Oh, oh, you mean in particular of hydro? No, no, I'm sorry. It was meant to be a joke. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. So, so the question still remains, right? Okay, so how I got here? I think um, we grew up in a very simple family, uh, where you know we used to uh, parents worked the eight to five job, and uh, we look forward to Saturday, uh, where we go shopping, and you know we get to because of the we get a Cadbury chocolate. You know those were the little trophies of our lives. Or we go to McDonald's once a year and that would be the heaven for us so we come from that family and um despite that my father lost his job when i was in grade eight uh actually grade six and um, the day you realize that your parents um your parents income is less than the monthly uh sorry your parents income is less than the monthly expenses you become an adult so the struggles begin began at a very young age, and you had to How old were you then? overcome. Sorry. How old were you at that point? I think I was um, probably twelve, ten, I, I, something. Yeah, but I remember grade eight, uh, grade six very clearly. That's when we lost the job, and uh, I, my father lost everything, and uh, we 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 basically yeah didn't have a roof on top of us, mm. so. So, yeah, so that's the day I became an adult and it was always like I was always hungry to achieve. If I saw something, the whole idea was that one day I'll have it. I'm not going to snatch it from someone else. I'm going to build it. I'm going to work towards it. And I and then later on, I realized that when you when you earn something, you value it, you appreciate it. And I think I think that that's really key. Uh, you know, to to for a person to lead, or you know, for a person to be to be successful. So down the lines, um, I um, I worked numerous jobs. Uh, I was a bartender. I worked at McDonald's for eight months. I washed cars. I did door to door sales, uh, and um, I basically, you know, I was a very shy person. I I started modeling in Vancouver. And uh, I was there on the runway in front of all these lights. And so I started to take up things as a challenge. And I started to break my own confidence, the boundaries I had set. So uh, came an opportunity where my father said, you should apply and go to India to study. From, and so this application was given by the Indian High Commission in Fiji. So I had seven days to decide I packed my bags and I went to, into the unknown. I was in India, in South India, in a very small village. And uh, basically, I could say I was in a lockdown. I was in a district. I didn't understand Hindi. I mean, I didn't understand Tamil, Telugu, because uh, I understand Hindi. And um, so the whole life was different. So it was all about, it all became about overcoming these challenges of, on a daily basis. And that's where I, you know, I spent two years working with automation and i was i told myself oh, okay in fiji we don't have this technology that that gap i saw that gap as a potential so i came back to fiji because and the main reason i came back to fiji was my mom and dad are here home is where the heart is and heart is where mom and dad are i mean i had an opportunity to, opportunity to go to germany and do masters but 
I just said, you know what? Let's just be there for those two people who taught me how to walk, taught me how to eat, taught me how to even reach this point. And so I came to Fiji and I, uh, I actually got a government grant because uh, the idea was, was innovative for them. And uh, there you go, Smart Farms Fiji took off. In the pursuit of finding profits, I found a purpose. What transpired was that my farm was going well. I got the grant. My farm is going well. I'm making enough profit. I didn't study business, but I'm learning how to buy and sell. Um, and um, then I realized to reach food security in Fiji, it's not the best technology. It's not the best capital investment. We need more farmers. So the awards that was given to me, I took it as like, okay, these organizations, which are very pristine and prominent, you know, they're so credible. They have given me an award. So my work is credible. And I, I took off um, um, implementing this and I designed a course and I started training people. You know, till date, I believe I've trained over 13,000 people, communities, you know, vulnerable communities. We've built farms in schools. I love the schools because I love working with kids. It's like, you know, at that tender age, if you plant that seed of knowledge at that age, you know, it tends to grow and, you know, build its foundation that how important food or growing your own food is, you know, in particular, because people can be rich, but we need people to be wealthy and health is wealth. If you really think of it. So, the whole, I, you know, things started to fall in place. The organizations I work with, they had their mentors, they had their advisors, panels, and they used to always help me polish, improve, and improvise. Sorry, I started talking about work because when people say, talk about you, you know, it's like I, I am the business, I am, you know, the whole core of it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I grew as a leader, my visions grew. And I started to work in this work towards this philanthropic space. And then one day I said to myself, Rinesh, I'm like, if you can achieve so much alone and the little impact you have done with the little funding that you have got, imagine what can I do on a national level? So I wrote this on my Facebook in 2017. No, sorry, in 2019. In 2019, because I had a similar post in 2017. I said, future politician. So I was somewhere manifesting this. And come the general elections 2023, I apply. And the people who I've helped uh, on just the basis of humanity, people who have heard my speeches, I've interacted with previously, you know, because I have met with them after elections and they said, we voted for you, we supported you. Well, you know, that means a lot for a first timer. So I think I have... I have grown as a person. Uh, I made my parents proud before I make my country proud. And now I see myself as someone leading these initiatives of actually empowering uh, people. I mean, with, who has a track record of empowering people? The party I'm with, you know, has a track record of, you know, the resilience they've shown during COVID and empowering people because under the previous government, I was one of the recipients of the funding they gave. So, you know, the smallest appreciation, the smallest opportunities can unlock God knows which opportunities for the younger people. So for me, I think uh, to be 29 years old and a member of parliament, I feel, I feel, I always feel like there is added responsibility that I need to execute. And I am just hungry for more. And what success for me as a person is the impact, the number of lives I can touch. So my work is my life and my life is my work. And this is what I have become. It's, it's ingrained in me. I sleep with it. I wake up with it. But I love what I do. And it loves me back. And then lastly, I like to say I'm born on Earth Day, 22nd April. So nature has been very kind. It has given me so much. And um, I work in the space of conserving and, you know, developing nature. So I think I think it's a give and take. So, yeah, that's 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 about me.
Brilliant. Okay, so which is your party in the parliament, Renat? Uh, current, it's called, they are called Fiji First, mm -hmm. and currently we are the opposition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what have your speeches been on that you've made in parliament? My speech is this week, Friday. No, but you've made speeches before. What have you been talking about in parliament? No, no, this is my first time. Your maiden speech. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, my maiden speech is on Friday. I'm the second one for what, Friday. Is it a secret or do we know what you're going to talk about? Ah, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be the, those, those 20 minutes is a lot's going to come out. I think I think a lot's going to be centered about what not the government, but what can you do for the country? Because sustain the individual or self sustainability is very important now, and the ideology of dependency or, I mean, COVID has taught us we were in our premises. Did did we utilize land? Did we harvest rainwater? Did we, you know, do things that can sustain us? You know, it's it's coming down to that. So I think I think it'll be more people focused because at the end of the day, I realize if you're not good with people, you won't be good at business, government, or basically anything. It's people that you need to know how people work and how to really, really uh, impact lives if you really want. Sure. Yeah. So when were you elected? Uh, 24 December 2022. Just recently. Mm -hmm. And I've never come before. I have never stepped into the parliament. So how many MPs are there? Uh, in total, 55. 55, okay. And do you have a constituency that you have to look after? Yes, we do. Yeah. So do you meet your constituents or how does that work in Fiji? Uh, currently, right now, I am I'm absorbing things as they come along. So... We are just, I mean, Parliament kicked off uh, this Monday, actually. Mm -hmm. so, Good. No wonder you're busy. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's chaos. <laughs> the amount Thank of you. Thank you so much for being with me today. So tell me more, because I was reading about Fiji and that there's 330 islands and 500 islets, roughly, right? That is quite amazing. So... Well, let's talk about food first. So, is there a lot of fish with all of that coastline? A lot of fish. Right. So, that's not an issue in terms of food security, a lot of fish, right? No. Right. So, people have enough protein, presumably, from the fish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which is very healthy protein, right? Yeah. Right. So, in that respect, Fijians are quite lucky. Um, but what you're adding with the hydroponic farming is the fresh fruit and vegetables, right? Or... Right. And tell me about the land and cultivation and what happened in the past and why there wasn't plenty of fresh, fresh vegetables. Well, I think to understand Fiji now, you have to go a few decades back. Mm -hmm. you know, Let's do that. Yeah. Let's do that. <laughs> Let's do this. So I think in, in 1987, Fiji saw its first coup, yes. uh, which is sort of based around the racial lines of division and segregation. Basically, the sugar industry, which was, which was our major, collapsed. Yes. yes. Uh, eventually. So, so the whole... So the, the farmers and, you know, their kids... And it sort of like impacted agriculture as a whole mm -hmm. because the farmers left the lands, the leases were not renewed. So it was just not... So how did, not... how did that happen? Who, who owned the land that didn't renew the leases? No, so, so we had a, 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 a group of people take over government. Yes. So, yeah, so, so basically it was more towards the indigenous um uh, you know in favor of the indigenous and not really again i mean and it was against the indo fijians the fijians who came from india the girmatiers were farming cotton and uh, sugarcane in fiji so uh so yeah it impacted these two industries and also uh farming was also not seen so we lost farmers because people didn't want to farm anymore and um you know, then they created a generation gap. 
and people were running to the you know the rural to urban rush because they just want to live in yeah, the city. Yeah, I was I was looking at about fifty percent of the population of one million live in in towns and cities, right? I mean that's quite high when I consider how much land mass you have actually. Well, very little land mass and very high traffic uh, <laughs> in the cities. Mm. Um, so, so there was a major shift uh, from the rural to to the urban centers, mm. and um, when I stepped into agriculture, people were like, um, you know, people were making a mockery out of it. They're like he studied software engineering, but he's selling vegetables and cabbages. Is he out of his mind? Uh, well, I would say entrepreneurs are crazy people um, until you make it a reality. And then everyone's like, oh, I knew that person. Yeah. I, <laughs> I knew I knew he would do something. They didn't know, but something. But um, so uh, land utilization reduced. Land ownership was the major concern in the country that we just wanted to acquire our land. But utilization was not really happening three decades ago. Mm. Uh, like the, uh, until the previous government came and made sure that subdivisions start to happen with tourism, you get a 99 year lease. But let's coming back to agriculture. Lands are lands are up to uh, lands are quite easy to acquire in places, but it's it's the initiative and it's the heart of people who are not driven to farm. No, they are not. During COVID, yes, people went back to their villages, to their areas, to their provinces, and they farmed. But after borders open, they came back and they, you know, they pursued with the previous jobs or something similar. So the whole ideology, it's all in the mindset over decades. Farmers would think, my son, a farmer would think, Julia, that my son is not going to be a farmer. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, they wanted to be a doctor, engineer, lawyer. Yeah, yeah. And then I come in with basically everything I can make look good. Mm. And I say, you know what? I'm going to be a farmer. And now I have... Well, really kind done. of, Rinesh, not exactly. <laughs> Bit of a I'm glamorous trying. farmer, if you ask me. <laughs> I'm trying, Julia. <laughs> well, yeah. you know, I think, Rinesh, what's amazing is you're actually making farming glamorous. So that's very cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying to model my way through, you know. <laughs> so... Um, again, yeah, I think I think modeling taught me a lot. You know, you could, I know I can carry a fork, a brush cutter with the same <laughs> confidence, you know, and be like, you know what, this is this is it. Um, but but the whole the the, the serious concern is that um, uh, people people don't want to cultivate. Yet I feel like and and uh, only during COVID people have, you know, initiated these things. But uh, but it was the whole mindset. And to be very honest, because we have a population, I believe, that's very walkable. We have a population where implementing the change we want to see can be done. It yeah. can be done, but yeah. as long as people are with us. Mm -hmm. so, so the generation gap existed. Farmers didn't get leases. So automatically food production reduced. Okay, and then climate change, uh, for example, with high humidity, more pests thrive. And these pests basically eat up the capsicums, the eggplants, the tomatoes. And it's not just one pest. It's a group of them. Mm. Yeah. It's a teamwork at best, you know. And, um, and so climate change is an issue. And climate change in this sense, we have a lot of unprecedented natural calamities. Uh, the cyclones are getting stronger. So in terms of food security, and that's why engineering in agriculture is so important. When you look at technology, it has revolutionized the way we hear and play music. Yeah. So, so why are we holding back with our food systems? You know, sometimes I feel like that businesses are a solution to a problem. In order for the business to be continuously being a solution to the problem, the problem must exist with our food systems. You know, this is how I see it, you know. Um, but yeah, but uh, people like me, and there, there, there are a few others I know who are trying, the youths, who are trying to make agriculture more, um, I don't know, how do I say this, to be embraced, mm -hmm. uh, to be done, to be practiced, to be followed. Um, so yeah, I come in and I start farming. And today I can say after five years that 
that farm, that soil has put me, has got me a seat in parliament to serve the nation. And I portray it as this is the power of our agriculture. This is the power of our people. So what I'm seeing right now personally is young people who want to be agri entrepreneurs because I have a whole bunch of messages from these people on my social media, which is very, very good to see. I feel I, this, I think, I think it's a reward that money can't buy. Uh, so I'm quite grateful, but slowly that, that ideology is, 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 is coming in now. Right. So can I just ask, so how much of, um, Fiji and the islands and obviously the soil, you know, the hundred or so inhabited islands, how much of it is actually arable land? Well, less than 50% of it. Mm. Mm. Salination is an issue. These are all volcanic rocks uh, or islands, you know, if you want to state it that way. And um, there is healthy soil, but again, to the businesses that keep up the economy, also pollute the environment, which is mm. raw material of the economy, you know. It's a, it's a debt th- uh, trap or debt cycle, I would I know, see it in that way. Um, but, but, but obviously agriculture is somewhat viable because if you think of the earlier success of the sugar crops. Um, so I just wonder if, uh, is your part of your vision to look at um, nations like New Zealand who've actually made serious inroads into real economic progress through value-added agriculture. Yes, that that would be the goal because yeah. Yeah. Um, value add is so important, not mm-hmm. just in terms of uh, you know getting having having better exports and GDP, but in in, in terms of uh, you know the ability to make people see beyond you know, you don't sell ginger for ginger anymore, you know, and tourism, you know, Fiji is massive on tourism. It's a brand that doesn't even need promotion, you know, so anything that's value added, into, you know, with any crop, uh, you know, and exported, you know, it's only going to do well for the country. But, but like I said, you know. Um, so what grows um, well in Fiji? You know, what value added crops grow well in Fiji? Ah, uh, ginger, turmeric. Uh, we have like eight varieties of kumala. Our sugarcane is massive. Uh, we have we have rice. Um, and what else we have? Yeah, we have dalo. We have uh, we have a variety of root crops. Um, you know, cabbage, mint. Um, yeah, we tomatoes. You know, ch- chilies, massive. Vanilla? Yeah. Can you grow vanilla? Yes, we can. Because vanilla is huge, isn't it? It's like Madagascar almost owns the vanilla crops of the world. The problem with vanilla is that I've, I've been working with farmers for the last nine years, and you know these farmers are pretty like very traditional. I, I and and they they tell me that you know what? Oh, we forgot to pollinate it because you need to pollinate it, you know, uh, at at a certain time, <laughs> otherwise the flower closes and. And done, you know, that's it. So, so I think, I think, um, the capacity building aspect of, you know, uh, knowledge building aspect is, it is not really, uh, deeply rooted. Um, so I think, I think, yeah, but the potential to grow vanilla and process it into, you know, oil extraction or, or the potential is, 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 is very high. Yeah. Very so vanilla, kava, yeah, that. Oh, kava, yeah. Mm. <laughs> that's, a, that's one of the highest selling commodities uh, that we have. Right, because there's some Pacific islands that sell quite a lot of kava, aren't there? Like Vanuatu, yeah, mm. very, very strong, very, very high quality kava. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a traditional drink, which sort of has become a social drink, and you can drink and drive. Yeah, police would not. Actually, they do. I heard about people being arrested for driving under the influence of kava in the U.S. But anyway, <laughs> let's not go there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can really see this. So I suppose what you're talking about is not just the hydroponic farming, but the entire economic 
focus on the policies towards farming and sustainable farming and presumably farming colleges and so on um, and farming business education within Fiji. I mean, it could be transformative, right? Indeed, indeed. We we need that transformative change and it needs to be led by someone who has the heart and passion. And then that person is able to acquire, you know, everything else. I think with the R&D facility in place, uh, with the connections and collaborations from universities around the world, you know, who have their research labs to connect with us. And I think, you know, when it comes to soil farming in particular, we don't feed the plants, we feed the soil. Yes. So the, the soil, I think for me, for me, for me, I believe that we need to make innovations and in, uh, interventions around the cycle of life. What comes from the soil goes back to the soil. And, uh, and um, so when we design uh, innovations around that, I think it would sustain um, the, our ecosystems and, and improve biodiversity. So when you come to improving the soil, if I had to improve agriculture, I would improve the soil. And how I would do that is, you know, have these policies in place where our waste management is taken care of, yeah. where our cardboards, which, which is heavily carbon, our grasses have nitrogen. Why are they burnt off? You know, adding more carbon pollution. So I think I think they come under these carbon sequestration projects where, you know, um, the councils, you know, that collect rubbish, you know, uh, make sure that every household separates, uh, separates these, these, these rubbish because they, they do it in Canada when I was there in 2012, but they don't do it in Fiji. We don't do it in Fiji. So, you know, I, I always think of these ideas that we get our waste, we get all the poultry waste, you know, we have, we have this huge compost site. Yeah. We our own nutrients. Yeah. When you look at fertilizer, and when you look at pesticides, which is actually the, one of the major cancer-causing agents, uh, you know, people eat healthy in the name of eating healthy, but you know, they are not grown in a healthy way. All well, logistics was done where preservatives were added, but they were synthetic. Eventually, causes you cancer, and you know, you can't bargain with healthcare buying medication. You cannot bargain there. So. Um, so to improve agriculture, you need to improve your waste management processes because that is the nutrient that needs to go to the soil. It's going to feed the plants, and that's the cycle that goes on. Huge work, but I think if done if done correctly, uh, you know, it's something that can continue. Oh, in terms of pesticides, so if you have like a neem tree, you know, plantation, and you have a machine that processes or extract neem oil, yeah, yeah. other things. You know, you have one of the best it's natural, a na natural, yeah, um, yeah. yeah, and these could be available to the farmers, you know, at a cheaper cost, uh, because again, we need to promote. I need to, you know, um, help the farmers to grow their businesses. Because what happens in Fiji is, you know, they they farm in basically without a greenhouse or without much equipment. It's a lot of hard work because I I come from there. And when a cyclone hits or heavy rain hits... Yeah, or, you know, often when we hear in the rest of the world about Fiji, it's because there's been a cyclone. <laughs> wow. I feel so good about, about <laughs> this. <laughs> and, and in my experience, we planted Kumala and some baby goat from the other side of the mountain came strolling by and started eating, you know, the, the, the Kumala shoots. And it's something like, you know, once the, 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 the plant, you know, um, once the saliva comes on the plant, the plant doesn't grow. So mm -hmm. I researched about it, but that, that's what transpires. So a farmer has a lot of issues that is not accounted for. And this is why I always feel that farmers are the heroes of the country. Yes, the medical field is too, but <laughs> but farmers who feed uh, people and I think I think they they need immense support. But there is a farmer in all of us. I believe that there is a leader in all of us, and we are responsible for our lives for the choices we make. So the initiative is to always, you know empower people by saying, you know, you need to take charge and control of your life, and you need to start farming. 
don't depend on the farmers. Farmers have problems. You know, agribusinesses have problems. Government will always have problems. The world has problems. Yeah. But, you know, Rinesh, farming the world over is quite a subsidized industry, isn't it? Because it's often seen Mm -hmm. as a sort of key a key function of any government and society that uh, food production, therefore the farming tends to be subsidised. So what do you see about that in Fiji? And you know, what policies do you think there should be in terms of subsidy? Or perhaps you haven't thought that out, but clearly that is a sort of mixture of incentives and subsidy, I would imagine, to really create sustainable farming. Well, the the previous government actually, uh, I, I know this one. Um, they provided uh, for the, in particular for the sugarcane industry. They would be as the the prices of fertilizers would go up, the government pays the difference, but the farmers only pay twenty dollars per bag. Mm-hmm. That same, and the government takes the cost as the cost increases because. I think with the war in Ukraine and Russia. Yeah, that's had a big impact on fertilizer, hasn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It massively. Oh, 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 just the fuel cost, you know. You know, and because we are heavily uh, dependent on importations of of, of a lot of things. So, yeah, there there was, there was, (laughs) there was this little crisis. Funny, you know, you see these little crises go on in Australia where the people are fighting over toilet paper. Uh, but, uh, but the, but the fact is that, yes, um, the government has placed in many initiatives, actually, they, they provide so many grants to the youths, uh, to the youths who want to take up agriculture. Uh, the support is there, but the issue there, Julia, is that we don't have people who want to farm. That's the biggest problem. But that, that's the same everywhere in Ash. It's not just Fiji, right? You know, it's not an aspirational thing to do generally to farm, which I think is why it's so important what you're doing. Yeah, I, 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 um, <laughs> I, I try to make it look good, but I always tell them that the hard, I mean, without hard work, you know, you're not going to get anywhere. No, I mean, I spent a lot, quite a lot of time when I was growing up on a farm in England, and that is really hard work. I mean, you know, my godfather was a farmer. He got up at often three, four in the morning, and it was wow. freezing, freezing, right? So I remember he used to come back about 6, 6.30 a.m. For, for breakfast, you know, because he'd already been out for two or three hours uh, because that's how early the day started. Of course, you know, it has its joys as well, that kind of life, but it's quite a tough life. Mm. It is. It is. I think. I think um, no money can buy that feeling in the world where um, you plant a seed and that seed becomes a fruit. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I think nature is so beautiful. It is, but ultimately, it's a business to make it sustainable. So I just want. Oh, yeah. That's why I'm sort of wondering about the subsidy, which I'm sure that the industry probably needs to create incentives. And what about export? You know, do you see any export possibilities, or in some of the higher value crops, or how would you see that working? Yes, uh, Fiji exports a lot of crops. Mm-hmm. I think A three fifty, which now Fiji has their own national airline, Fiji Airways. You know, has played a instrumental role uh, in exporting. You know, uh, the produce that is grown locally, because. Fiji has witnessed, like I said, after the 87 coup, uh, a lot of migration has happened since then. Uh, And it's because, yes, people, uh, they want more from life or they want, you know, different platforms, different countries. Uh, That's fine. Uh, But they miss because because I, you know, I put it this way. Some of the things grown in Fiji, you would not find it anywhere else. You know, it's just it makes you feel like home. So that one dish would make you feel like home. So a lot of Fijians around the world uh, enjoy the Fijian crops. So this is how Fiji, you know, is is importing. I mean, sorry, exporting mm. uh, red papaya, a lot of dalo, a lot of cassava. Yeah, a, a, a lot of the root crops uh, is, is is major major for us. Breadfruit as well. We have um, I, f- I forgot the name. Um, we have this organization that actually works with a lot of farmers, uh, and uh, you know they get their produce and oh AMA AMA is under the Ministry of Agriculture mm-hmm. as well. 
I think this is Nature's Food Way or something. They're also an organization that works with a lot of farmers because it's a whole process of that the crops need to go through biosecurity and, you know, uh, to check for any pest infestations. Uh, but yeah, but we are big on crop imp- uh, export. Right. And so is that mainly, are that, you know, is that some of it exported by container ship as well? And how does that work? And what are the main export markets? Oh, yeah. The main export markets is New Zealand, Australia and US. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Three Three, because these are the three major points where Fijians have migrated to over these decades. Mm. And and we hold very good relations with, with these countries, you know. You know, they've always supported us in, in times of need. And, uh, you know, we, we are very, um, and the ambassadors too, you know, for over a couple of years, you know, they've worked with a num- numerous groups in Fiji about uh, with numerous initiatives uh, um, so yeah, they're, they're really, really making a difference with not just, uh, export, but, you know, having their presence felt in Fiji. And, uh, I've, I've been uh, personally a part of, you know, these events and I got to learn so much from them. So what so, about yeah. aquaculture? Are you moving on to that as well? Because presumably with the enormous coastlines, there must be huge scope for aquaculture and fish farming. Well, I have studied aquaphonics. I have just not implemented it. Mm. Yeah, so... But whether you I, need really need aquaponics or whether it's something more, perhaps a natural solution when you have such enormous coastline. I mean, that's, you're not short of coastline. <laughs> <laughs> okay. On a rough day, would you get in a boat <laughs> and say, I'm going to fish today? Fishing people do. You know, that that's the life, that's isn't fun. it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's, it's crazy out at sea. Um, um, yes, we do, but it's it's uh, a, a lot of uh, the previous government because you know there's been a gov- change of government just recently. It's just been a month. Um, so the previous government was in power for the last sixteen years. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of uh, initiative. I think ten thousand dollars was given. To the first timer who for first timer who wants to start up a fisheries business, and it goes up to two hundred thousand, yeah. But this is more of an in-house, you know, uh, fisheries mechanism. Um, along the coastal lines, it's more like people who just get on a boat, go fishing. If they find stuff, they have their usual spots beside the road, and they're selling their produce, and uh, yeah, it's quite it's quite simple. Yeah, I mean, it would be kind of interesting to look into the fishing rights and how they're being managed and so on. But I guess that that's another project beyond what you're doing at the moment. Beyond, beyond. Yeah, I've not even uh, stepped into into that uh, space. So tell me more now about the hyd- hydroponics business, because, you know, when I looked at what you're doing with the kits, I thought, "Ooh, I want one of these. <laughs> they look amazing. So where do you source the kits? How did you put them together? Tell me all about the nuts and bolts of that. Oh, wow. It's like giving the secret soup away. No, no, no. Uh, you can leave a few key <laughs> details out. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, well, that reminds me, there's two parts to it. One can build it. But if you don't know the if you don't know the technicalities, you would not be able to operate it successfully. Yes, yeah. yeah, so there's always two parts to it because YouTube shows you how you can build it. So what I, what I did was, um, it's basically simple plumbing work. You need to know how pressure works with you know submissible pumps, and um, the pump is the heart of the system. And so basically, what I did, I saw some materials not the correct materials, but the substitutes, which I thought would be viable. So it's been like seven years of testing and, you know, many, many components put together and see how, you know, when they're integrated together, how they function. So, yeah, I kind of like sourced, I had, like I said, I have a lot of failures more than successes. So where do you source the, um, the components from? Uh, local hardware stores or some store that sells aquarium products, or I would import, actually would import most of my things if I have a project at hand. Uh, and I'd assemble, But I would assemble it together. Mm-hmm. So after finishing engineering, I think, yes, take, it takes me back 
So I, I, I live in the city, in Latoka city. My backyard space is like 12 meters by 15 meters. So I set up a uh, 200, 200, about 100, 144 planter system. Yeah, 144 planter system um, with tubes and pipes I could find. So basically whatever scrap I could find or whatever waste I could find, I kind of tried to put it together and see how it works. I learned carpentry. I learned plumbing. I learned welding, which is very scary. I don't want to weld again in my life. I hate the smell of burnt steel. Uh, um, yeah. I hope you're and, wearing uh, your face guard, Rinesh, when you do that. <laughs> yeah. Here's me trying to be a hero and trying to get things done right before me. Um, we learn it the hard way. Oh, God. So yeah, I remember, yeah, the one one flame, uh, I wore the glasses and one flame came right between the glasses and my eye and it went out, yeah. my, my right, my left eye. And since that day, I said, I'm not touching the welding machine or the grinder, which is very scary. Uh, so I try to avoid these, these products, uh, I mean, these machines. But yeah, I took it up by myself that, oh, I'm going to build this, build that. So I was like the Bob the Builder. I tried putting things together. Hydrophonics has many systems. You have deep water culture, you have NFT, which is a neutron film technique. You have a a frame as well. Um, so many different systems, uh, but a few technicalities would change according to the system. No system is different. Or you can have a normal uh, wicking system where you just have a, a wick submerged, submerged in the neutron solution and uh, the plants automatically, you know, receives water. So, yeah. Um, so what about power? What, how do you, does it need power or is it solar powered or how does it work? Yes. Yeah, so the pumps can be uh, solar powered or mm -hmm. it can be connected to the grid. Yeah. So electricity is quite reasonable. I would say cheap. And the pumps, you know, it depends on the pumps as well. So and these are aquarium pumps that I use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in the beginning, the shopkeeper was like, how many fish do you have? I'm like, I have plants. <laughs> and he thought, he thought I was nuts. I was like, but I didn't, you know, give him the details. Uh, <laughs> but later on, then he found out when he read in the papers, he's like, oh, you're the guy who buys all my pumps. <laughs> yeah, because so, we, we actually did a webinar with a company in Malaysia that was actually making hydroponic kits um you know of all sizes um over a year ago we did that so um we looked at it quite a lot yeah yours sound very um bespoke for the local environment yeah. nice nice yeah. and the the kit the kit or the type of kit or the size of the kit changes according to the customer's preferences yes, yes uh their time and effort that they want to put in so you go with a bigger tank so that the fluctuations of ec and ph is quite less so yeah based on consultation i think with with the customer or the beneficiaries then we implement accordingly but yes everything for hydrophonics to function successfully is available in fiji that's great. That's great. So do you see hydroponics as more like a kind of kickstart and a supplement perhaps to a much bigger initiative in farming? Or do you see it as you know, more dominant in farming in the long run in Fiji? Well, if you, uh, it depends on the person now with their vision and how, how much they are hungry for. Yeah, because hunger drives you, uh, the hunger to achieve uh, so and go beyond. So I believe that hydrophonics would be what you just said to soil farming, you know, mm -hmm. something, the bigger picture uh, or, you know, the bigger investment or the bigger in scale and scope. But I think the future of farming is aquaphonics because it's a man-made, uh, organic ecosystem where the fish and the plants coexist and just simple nitrification processes, um, the waste of urea and ammonia, you know, they break down and 
the plants get what they want, the fish get clean water, and you get both the fish, uh, animal protein, and you get plant, plant protein. Uh, I, so I think aquaphonics would be the bigger one because our oceans are not the same anymore. Our oceans are heating up. Our fish have plastic in them. I know it's, it's a pity we, we contribute the least to climate change, yet we suffer the most. Yeah, can we talk a bit about climate change in Fiji, Rinesh? Oh. Because, I mean, you know, that must be a major issue with so many islands. And if we're, if we're concerned about coastal erosion. Oh, massively, massively. Um, there, there are villages, uh, I don't know by name, but I've heard in presentations recently that needs immediate relocation. Uh, I visited one personally uh, during my campaign right just out of my city. And I was, I mean, just a, not even a meter. And then the, the waves on a high tide, you know, hits the, the, the side of the house. That's scary. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, loss of land does exist, and it doesn't exist just around, along the coastal lines. You know, my I have my uncle has a twelve acre sugarcane farm, so like ten acres is invested in sugarcane, and he has a river that goes, you know, at the back of the land, and he's like the the access road after the land, and then the river, you know, in between the river, is gone. Basically, that's the river now. <laughs> so we are having these little issues now because of increased flooding. You know, the banks fall out. So it's not just the coastal. We have the banks falling out too. And yes, the government is trying their best. I think uh, previously they have, they have many initiatives where they have tried to hold it, hold it up. But there's only so much you can do. And after COVID, you know, it's been... Um, uh, it's like a ship that was capsized and you're back sailing now. So, um, so yeah, we, we, we do see land loss. And, you know, what's happening actually in Tuvalu is scary. You know, once a year we have a king tide. That king tide is pretty scary. I've seen the pictures. You know, the normal roads we drive on, we have like... I've seen those pictures too. They're absolutely immersed, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and the sad part is that Fiji is, is massive on tourism. That yeah. means the majority of our hotels is, uh, are located along the coastal lines. Yeah, of course. Mm. And sometimes I think, okay, maybe I may not be alive to see that day, but we need to relocate those beaches that you, you know, want to dive in right from your, in your room. You mm. run and dive. I don't think that would be quite possible. In time to come, yes in time to come but uh the other pacific islands like kiribati yes kiribati is is losing land very fast very fast yeah so is fiji because it's quite volcanic is it slightly more elevated than some of these other islands Mm. yeah right right so i suppose that that's kind of a good thing isn't it um can you tell me a bit about any plans you might have for sort of ecotourism based on the amount of organic and hydroponic farming and all of that? Because, I mean, that's quite an attraction that people are very interested in nowadays, isn't it? Sorry, can you re- re- repeat? Yes, I just wonder if you have any thoughts about um, ecotourism around the whole concept of organic farming, everything you're doing with hydroponics and so on, being an absolute attraction for people to come and visit Fiji to see this and enjoy this sustainable food and sustainable experience. Yes, I think I think um, uh, I had reached out to when I was an entrepreneur. I tried reaching out to resorts, uh, telling uh, on on the ideology of how they can be sustainable, uh, not in just in terms of supply, but in terms of being very cost effective. Yeah. Because one cost effective aspect is growing the crop the other one is eliminating logistics and there's no carbon footprint so um we were taking a lot of boxes with this ideology and the whole concept was that when tourists come to the resort they also get to you know walk 
within or around or into these farms. You know, there is growing soil uh, crops in soil and and in in a water based solution. So I think that uh, with transparency uh, creates value uh, and value when you have value, you know, you can sell at a price that you feel like because you're selling an emotion. Uh, so again, that improves uh, pro- profit or generation or income generation. There was one little concept I thought of. Uh, Shangri-La, I believe, uh, called me three, four months ago, which, you know, I haven't really got to. Yeah, or even, uh, come, you know, I mean, apart from the whole experience of Fiji, be- hopefully becomes more and more um, sort of dependent on sustainable farming. Um even to visit and actually have the experience of doing some of this farming while you're staying there, that would be a pretty meaningful experience for a lot of people. Yes, yes. Um, I well, I'm going to be here. Yeah, I, 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 I don't think I can live anywhere else apart from Fiji. I can travel, uh, but I want to come back home. Um, when I started my NGO. A smart farms foundation i had this concept of a training academy mm-hmm. yeah. and a concept of a exhibition farm mm-hmm. i found where people would be like hey you know let's or family would be like with you know family of four with two kids be like let's go and visit that farm because i need to teach my kids the importance of agriculture or some something on that note is what i thought uh yes we grow crops and we sell them to sustain the NGO so we, that we never have to really write a proposal, you know, to get funding, which is a very hectic process. It is. It's so time consuming, isn't it? <laughs> I love all my hair. And, uh, and um, yeah, so I like to think of sustainable models, but the whole concept of ticking a lot of boxes, you know, with the SDGs, uh, but also, uh, with the people that you know, this is this is what Fiji needs. This is what every household needs. So when you leave that exhibition farm, you're like, okay, at least I can go and plant something in my backyard. So yeah, I if 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 I if I'm in this space, um, I have these power. Uh, not I wouldn't say powers. I would say the responsibilities, and I really hope um, if ever or soon. If we are in government and I become the minister for agriculture or fisheries, you know, either way, I know I really get to um, bring in all the collaboration and support and uh, make it happen for my country. This is this is the vision, and uh, I'm going to dedicate my years of life to this. So um, when when is the next election, Renat? Oh, 2026. Well, that's good because you're going to have a lot of time to, you know, sharpen up your ideas and everything else in opposition, aren't you? That's not always a bad thing. Oh, true, true, true. I, I, I'm in the. I'm not in the race of life. I'm just in the journey of it to learn. Yeah, and presumably you have cross-party committees and so on. Do you in Fiji and Parliament? Yes, we have committees, but I currently am not on any committee. Well, I'm sure you will be at some point. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot of work. <laughs> so tell me, where do you see Smart Farms Fiji in five years' time? So how much time are you going to be able to devote to that when you're doing your parliamentary work? Uh, so I do oversee things because uh, according to law, uh, we can uh, hold office in the parliament and uh, still be the directors of our company. But I have transferred it to my father. Mm -hmm. My dad, um, actually, I didn't mention this. When I was 21 years old, I started my first business. Mm -hmm. That was a little birthday gift to myself. And I started with importing solar solar lights because it was duty-free. And so dad, dad handles that company. It's a wholesaling company and dad sees overseas smart farms, Fiji, uh, in terms of supplies, in terms of materials. So smart farms, Fiji, um, you know, does, it is, is there, but to, the NGO has done a lot more work in mm-hmm. terms of capacity building trainings and farm implementations. So for me, 
I have these pockets of opportunities. You know, if something comes up for Smart Farms Fiji, I know this is this webinar was in particular for Smart Farms Fiji. Uh, but Smart Farms Fiji is heavily invested in um, in the production of crops. So, okay, to think to 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 rightfully, if I envision this, Smart Farms Fiji in the next five years should have acquired land, should have acquired a processing facility and we get to provide seedlings to some of the uh, my associate farmers who i work with previously and uh, they grow these crops and we buy it off them so we are the provider and we are the market uh and then we process these uh, you know like ginger i'm i'm very big on ginger i love ginger too and it, hey it's huge in china if you want to export <laughs> I definitely send you an email or call you up even <laughs> for more information about that. Um, uh, yeah, so um, I'm always into value add. I'm always into processing it. Let's make it a powder. Let's make it a paste. Uh, my family just recently started a pharmacy. So I was also thinking down the line that, okay, the pharmacy can work together and, you know, promote these healthy products locally yeah. grown, you know, yeah, you know, I, I was thinking as well about the sort of value-added herbal, nutraceutical type products. Uh, we have so much lemongrass that grows like jungle. You know, if you have uh, if you have a facility set up just to extract the lemongrass oil, yeah, yeah. Uh, mint mint oil. So, so this is this is the future. I'm thinking for Smart Farms Fiji. Um, haven't really um, because it's it's agriculture that I want to be in. Whether it's if if I grow kumala, I'm always in, I was interested in making like kumala powder, uh, so you can you know make your uh, buns, you can make your bread, because um, I'm big on healthy living and working out, and kumala is one of the best things I can have, uh, apart from rice and any other starchy food. It, it's very it's, it's sorry, it's a very good bodybuilding food. So this is what I see for smart farms, Fiji. I see I see. I see, I see more growth, but uh, I hope, I hope my dad or my family, you know, sticks to that path. Uh, while I have uh, huge uh, aspirations in the political space, but uh, but yeah, at the end of the day, it's all for improving the health and well-being um, uh, for this country. That's wonderful. So how do you think the Commonwealth could um, be used as a platform to support Fiji as a nation as well as smart farms? Um, well, the ability uh, for the Commonwealth, well, first of all, with this webinar, you have, I, I like to, my sincere and profound gratitude to you and your team uh, for reaching out to me and giving me this time and space to share my little journey. Uh, we come from a place where, you know, well, you know, people say that, you know, I know I like to say, you're never too young to make a difference or coming from Fiji islands, you're never too small to make a difference. Uh, yeah, so well, you know, I'm sure that's very humble of you, Ranesh. I'm sure you'd be making a difference wherever you were, but uh, yeah, well, if the, how do you think the Commonwealth can help? I mean, obviously we will do our best to put the word out, but you know, would you like more visitors from the Commonwealth? Would you like more business? What what would you be thinking of? I think all of it, you know, whatever you suggest, you know, all of the above. I like to just, you know, take the multiple choice. <laughs> but yeah. in, ter in terms of business, yes, definitely, because there is so many, so many aspiring youths in this country yeah. who have, a, who have, um, who have passion? Who are passionate with their initiatives, and not just passionate, but they have the financial literacy training. Because I always say the best cassava farmer is not the best cassava seller. Yes. Okay. Yes. Growing it is one thing; the yes. ability to sell it is the other. Yes. And I think Commonwealth uh, spreads more uh, of their um, initiatives or their success stories, uh, you know, with the in uh, academic institutions in Fiji or the, the schools, you know, they're very, they're very kind uh, and they're very welcoming. Fiji is mm. a very welcoming nation. Uh, so, yeah, I think in terms of just knowledge sharing to begin mm. with, uh, from the business aspect, if investors are willing to work here uh, or invest in companies, 
even in smart farms fiji you know i actually love to hear them out consider learn contribute um and and um, you know may make it happen because it's not just profit based my mindset is more of a green entrepreneur where the environment to flourish at the same time with 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 people and you know with the entity itself so i think in terms of the nation the academic institutions are always open the government is always welcoming um feel free in terms of investment yes in terms of empowering other young uh, other people the young people of this country because the thing is when we were in school i feel old now wow uh, uh, <laughs> when we were in the high school no one really came to us and said oh you know you could study this and then study that and then you could get a job for example commonwealth you can work for the commonwealth you can work for the un you can work for the european union mm-hmm. you know imf world bank there was never really a guidance but in if if and that's what still i feel like is lacking despite people having smartphones that it's directionless yeah 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 a bit directionless mm-hmm. perhaps people need to be have the opportunities perhaps uh, made more clear to them yeah mm-hmm. yeah and was it was just like okay be a doctor lawyer or nurse can't do that can't be a pilot it's too expensive uh yeah was <laughs> so i mean that was a dream to be a pilot well, i'm sure when you're a successful entrepreneur and everything else you will easily qualify as a pilot no i rather own a plane and hire them yeah. <laughs> <laughs> jokes apart but yes um feel free to reach out to us yeah. um feel free to um uh if if there's more platforms of, of yeah absolutely we will we will well then um, yeah. thank you so much yeah and you know really wish you every success with your speech is it going to be online can we watch it your speech yes it will be online amazing yeah, so i'm going to share the link with everybody who signed up for the webinar so uh, send it to me i will be sending that out and we'll be uh, we'll be reaching for you ranesh okay so uh, Thank you so much. Well, Rinesh Sharma, the youngest um, member of parliament in Fiji and the great entrepreneur of Fiji uh, Farms. That's wonderful and it's been so great talking to you. I do hope we can talk again soon. Thank you so much, Julia. Well, that brings us to the end of today's webinar and I'd like to take another moment to thank our speaker again for sharing his valuable insights and experiences with us and shedding more light on the critical issue of food security in Fiji. and all the challenges that are waiting to be tackled in Fiji in which I am sh- sure that he as a member of parliament is going to play his part in tackling i also hope you've come away with a clearer sense of the steps that could be taken to address the issue and to make a positive impact on the fijian community we look forward to seeing you again soon take care and bye